Barbie, Poor Things, Anatomy of a Fall, and a bit of a slice of Oppenheimer there, all in the running at the Oscars tonight. Film critic Van Connor is watching along. Van, good evening, sir. Good evening to you, Daryl. Um, so it starts about 40 minutes or so, doesn't it? And we're at, I think we probably have to start with where we ended there, which was Oppenheimer, uh, that, that could very well break some records tonight. Well, actually, because of daylight savings, the ceremony is now officially underway. So we are oh. about to get our uh, our very first award, which is going to be for the best supporting actress, which I do think is going to uh, divine Joy Randolph. But she oh. is kind of the exception to the Oppenheimer sweep. Like Oppenheimer, I think is 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 getting the acting nods. It's getting the directing nod. It's quite clearly going to get best picture. It does seem to be Oppenheimer's year, definitely. And. Um... That has sort of been the trend at the other other awards ceremonies, hasn't it? In terms of in terms of the chance of actually breaking that record, though, which would be what would that, what would that be? I think would that be twelve or thirteen wins potentially? Yeah, you're in the early teens when you start getting to things like uh, like Titanic. Notes Titanic was the last great big sweeper. Uh, Eleven, I think lower- that one did it. I think so. I think that puts it near on par with uh, Return of the King. I think Return of the King did it pretty well at the Academy Awards uh, as well. Oppenheimer does not have anywhere near that level of nominations, so it's not quite that heavy uh, a front-loaded you know, potential winner. But it's going up against, you know, for instance, Poor Things and Barbie, which have gotten their share of nominations as well. But there's nothing this year that stands out as an obvious favourite on the nominee front, quite like Oppenheimer. Okay, um, a lot of eyes on poor things, though, and particularly Emma Stone for her Mm. role. Well, Emma Stone has become a late favourite for Best Actress. Like, it was Lily Gladstone. Going into this awards season, we were all talking about Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, she was the the front-running favourite. But since Poor Things opened kind of widely around the world around Christmas, like a couple of months after Flower Moon, Emma Stone has emerged as the likelier candidate, I think. I mean, I would see it as a 50-50 thing either way, but it's, it's between Gladstone and Regular Stone for who's taking best actress this year definitely right um barbie been a bit of a disappointment uh, a disappointing award season for them so far hasn't it why i mean it feels like i mean you know we, we all sort of enjoyed and subscribed mm. to the sort of barbie heimer thing the whole release of barbie and oppenheimer at the same time doesn't seem to have carried its weight through award season why not what's going on I think I think the Academy generally generally struggled to try and laud a film as popcorn friendly and fun as Barbie, and it does show. You, you think it, it would feel almost obligatory, for instance, for Coretta Gerwig to have gotten a Best Director nomination, and yet she didn't. It would feel obligatory again in that way that Margot Robbie would get. Whether I agree with it or not, I don't personally think Margot Robbie should get back Best Actress nomination, but it does seem strange to put the plaudits out that they have for Barbie, but have notably excluded it from certain categories, to have to, to have to have shunned it the way they have. Also, they've given it two best song nominations, and it is taking that home. Don't get me wrong, Billie Eilish will take Barbie home an, a, an Oscar win for best original song, but it's going to be for the one song that nobody remembers. <laughs> from the Barbie movie. Everybody remembers I'm Just Ken, or they remember Dance the Night Away by Dua Lipa. Nobody remembers. I couldn't even tell you the title of the Billie Eilish one offhand. No, I no, I agree. I, I was, In fact, I was thinking, oh, but no, it's obvious. It's the one about dancing. But actually, no, that was Dua Lipa, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah, you're right. Was, yeah. <laughs> no idea. No idea. Um, Ryan Gosling is expected, I think, Van to perform. Is he, he's performing tonight, isn't he? He is, and he is going to have... He's, he's performing with Mark Ronson. They are doing I'm Just Ken. And they are going to have 65 Ken backup dancers. It's going to be one of the largest musical numbers ever attempted at the Academy Awards. So, if wow. nothing else, I would argue that that is about as on-brand as you could possibly get for Barbie. Um, shall I bring some breaking news? Go for it. Uh, best Supporting Actress has been called. Uh, oh, do you know it? Do you know the result? I, I don't know the result. I'm in the next room. Is it Divine Joy Randolph? It's Divine Joy Randolph. Yes! Look at that getting. <laughs> for, um, for, for the holdovers. Um, t- 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 tell me about her. I mean, that, that is a, I mean, it, I, I mean a, a, an unlikely win. We talk about Emma Stone a little bit. Although she a supporting actress, was she? Well, what was she? No, she's best actress, uh, no. she, Emma Stone. Sorry, I've got mixed up. Emma, Stone's up, for, uh, Emma Stone's up for actress. Divine actress. Was, was, was she the favourite, uh, Divine Joy, Joy Randolph, then? Is that an obvious 
pick? I think so. As, as you said yourself, looking at the other awards and the things that had been handed out in the run-up to tonight's festivities, um, the SAG Awards, the Screen Actors Guild, those are usually a very good indicator as to which way the awards are going for actors. And uh, Divine Joy had actually won at that show. Also, it had gone to Emma Stone for actress, and then it had gone to the Oppenheimer Boys for best actor and best supporting. But uh, we, we kind of knew it was going to clearly be Divine Joy Randolph. I'm very happy for it. It's a great performance in a great movie that has had a little bit of controversy this past week. There's been accusations of plagiarism um, on its now Oscar-nominated screenplay. But it's a terrific film. And there was there was a sort of feeling that the holdovers would sort of kind of come out of nowhere at the last minute and take over this year's awards, like, rather like Green Book, in that way that it was going to be a late surge. Right. Um, in the in the time that you have been on, you went from it's got underway and we're going to have Best Supporting Actress sort of any moment now, to now finally, a whole 10 minutes later, getting Best Supporting Actress. Is this going to be a really long night, Van? How long does this thing go on for? <laughs> it goes on until, uh, I think it's a, it's meant to be about 3.30. I think it's going to be about 2.30 hour time because of daylight savings. I mean, that's messed it up slightly. Uh, but yes, it's going to be a long it's going to be a long night. I think it's 20 plus uh, categories to be announced. I know next we've got uh, the animated categories going and then the screenplay categories. And it's when we get to the screenplays, I'm really going to feel how long this night is because I have no idea which, one, which way that's going. Right, okay. And just, just very briefly, uh, Jimmy Kimmel uh, is uh, is host tonight. Safe pair of hands? A very safe pair of hands. The man knows what he's doing. I caught the opening monologue a few minutes ago, and, you know, vintage Kimmel, it was, it was, uh, it was funny, but it wasn't, like, too hard. It wasn't too pointed. There were, there were some nice jabs taken, you know, about the strikes, about, you know, which way people have voted in the categories and things like that. There have been some good shots taken, but like you say, safe hands. He knows how to rein it in without offending people, definitely. Mm, okay. Uh, we will watch closely. Van, we'll, we'll uh, chat to you again a little bit later on tonight. And you're going to keep watching for us uh, and bring us the latest as it happens from Los Angeles. Uh, as the Oscars gets underway, uh, film critic Van Connor uh, with us on Times Radio tonight. Uh, so that news. Uh, let's head over to LA, though, and to Van Connor, who isn't in LA but is watching it closely for us. Van, film critic, of course. Uh, the Oscars tonight, my friend. Um, we've just, I think, had a, a win for Robert Downey Jr. as Best Supporting Actor. Is that right? We have indeed. Third nomination, first win. Robert Downey Jr. finally has his Oscar. And to be honest, we, we all kind of saw this coming. It feels very much like a, a sort of we owe you one kind of an award, like a, a designation. It's less about Oppenheimer than it is about what RDJ has meant to the industry for the past 15 years. I mean, the ultimate comeback story, really. Second only maybe to, well, actually, ahead even of Travolta now. Right. Um... He, he, I mean, a proper icon, isn't he? Really? A oh yeah, proper icon. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, so that that is is that and that's Oppenheimer's first victory. That is Oppenheimer's first victory of the evening, which I mean, is bizarre because Poor Things has, has garnered three awards so far. You know, for yeah. production design, uh, uh, costumes, hair and makeup, which not unsurprising, but it's it's interesting that you know the night is starting off on on Poor Things aside, even though as you yourself have, have, have mentioned a few minutes ago, this is expected to to really tip over to Oppenheimer towards the back half of the evening, definitely. Yeah. Um. So. It is, I mean, were, were poor things expected to win those? Uh, I think it was costume and production design, wasn't it? I had odds on it winning costume and production design because Poor Things combines both a period piece aesthetic, which the Academy generally loves, as well as sort of fantasy elements as well. So you kind of get to have your cake and eat it with that. You you, you get the period piece costume, but you get that, that flourish of fancy with it as well. And um, just sort of in general, how's the awards been? I've seen a picture of a very naked man at some point. <laughs> Yeah, John Cena appeared uh, in a state of complete undress to announce the the winner of the best costume uh, design. And it's, other than that, it's been fairly kind of what we would have expected, really, of tonight's uh, of tonight's festivities. The awards have kind of gone the way we would have expected. The biggest surprise, really, I think, was American Fiction getting best adapted screenplay, but that really wasn't 
that much of a surprise. I I, I think in terms of the uh, best original screenplay, that went to Anatomy of Fall, again, kind of expected. The uh, the big one for me, though, and uh, there was a sort of two-horse race in the best international feature category. It was between Anatomy of a Fall, Justin Trier's really entertaining uh, French courtroom thriller, um, and it was up against uh, The Zone of Interest, made by our very own Jonathan Glazer, and that has now set the record. That is now the first British film to ever win Best International Feature at the Academy Awards. So the zone of interest uh, now has its now has its stamp on British cinema history. So, so Britain qualifies as international cinema. We do indeed. That that is terrible of me, isn't it? That that because yeah. like, that's so like exceptionalist sort of kind of like you know thinking that we're the center of the universe. That how can we possibly uh, be <laughs> an international <laughs> cinema? It's all about us. But of course we are. Yeah. But, I mean, it's even weirder in the case. I mean, you look at something like a zone of interest, which is a very international co-production, but it's 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 thought of as a British film. It's, you you had this a few years, uh, like a decade ago now, with Gravity, for instance, which was generally considered to be a British film, even though everyone who sat and watched Gravity, as far as they were concerned, was watching you know an American studio blockbuster. We never yeah. quite know anymore. Yeah, uh, Nadira Tudor is with us as well tonight. Uh, Nadira, hello. Uh, well, l- listen, I love the Oscars, but. I'm interested to know, Ben, what did you think about the controversy with, uh, controversy with Barbie? Because I was one of the people who actually didn't like it. And even though it took $1.45 billion, I could not understand why there's been such a hoo-ha, should we put it that way? I really like Barbie, and I think it's nice. I mean, if we're being objective about Barbie, Barbie is no more uh, nuanced or, or 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 deep than the Lego movie. It's, it is literally a live-action version of the Lego movie. Its plot actually does follow a eerily similar trajectory, and it makes kind of similar points. But it's one of those things where the Lego movie was quite highly regarded when it, when it opened a decade ago, and seeing it done in live-action, I think, gave it the uh, the kudos to actually be you know uh, propelled into a, a awards league status. In terms of I think it was the surprise. I think because so many people had expected a Barbie movie conceptually to be so terrible. You know, just it, it sounds like the worst idea ever, rather like a Lego movie did. But to actually see it, to see it done well, and to see it done rather sincerely, and, well, I mean, as straight-faced as it is, given that it's a comedy, but to see it done with the meaning and the nuance that it actually was was kind of a surprise. And to see it done with the, the commitment that both Margot Robbie and uh, Ryan Gosling brought to it again even though it's you know on on the surface is a comedy i thought was really impressive i didn't expect to see it sweep the awards by any by any metric uh, and i don't quite buy into the idea that oh, greta gerwig was snubbed because you know she's she got a screenplay nomination out of it margot robbie wasn't snubbed for an actress because she's still a producer on it the thing is up for best picture so that could call that qualifies as her oscar and you know they get to own the musical side of tonight as well i mean i was shocked in one sense that they didn't get production design yeah, I mean, they've done pretty well with the nominations, really, haven't they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in terms of, you know... In is terms that, of is that, is that their win, design, Van? Is that their win? Their, their win here is the nominations, not the victories. I think so, but they are going to get best song. I, I genuinely, hand on heart, believe that Billie Eilish song is getting the Oscar for best original song. I mean, the only thing that's coming close this year is going to be I'm Just Ken. And the, the, the Oscars do not give the awards to the fun ones. It just never happens. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, uh, so, so I don't know. I don't know what this involves, uh, Van. So you have to help me out here. But somebody's asked me to ask you about the anatomy of a fall, messy controversy. So this is the dog, isn't it? What's the controversy? <laughs> this is messy. The dog went to the awards luncheon uh, recently, and uh, the response to Messi's presence was was quite controversial. Other other performers and other productions and studios complained that having Messi present counted as a publicity stunt and shouldn't be allowed. Oh. And uh, the, the, there were gen- genuine complaints have been made, like formal <laughs> complaints have been made to the Academy over Messi the dog, who, as we've you know obviously established in the past hour, is present at the ceremony and is a very good boy. It has to be said, he's <laughs> a very good boy. <laughs> he is there. He is. There. I've got a picture he, of him right now. He absolutely, right now, absolutely <laughs> killed that guy as well. I'm sorry if you read between the lines. If you've seen an Nightmare before and you read between the lines, he killed that guy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was the one. It was all him. Okay, um, just um, just very briefly, uh, very briefly, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the Oscars. Uh, some more uh, results uh, from that before we uh, before we uh, go off tonight. But um, 
Uh, Nadir has picked out a story to talk about. I, I wonder if we can talk about it with you as well, just quickly, because I know you've got, you've got other Oscar stuff to get on to. Um, but Nadira, can you just, just briefly introduce us to this story about trigger warnings on uh, films? I mean, it's a classic sort of almost culture war kind, kind of issue, this isn't it, Nadira? But mm. there is an interesting sort of development this week. What, what, what have you seen? Yeah, so basically, um, <clears throat> this is an interview with the Sunday Times with Kate Blanchett, who I love as an actress. She's absolutely amazing, um, saying that trigger warnings imply a lack of respect between artist and audience, which is, which is interesting. And what she's saying is that <clears throat> she says audience should be challenged and that tough conversations are part of the artistic approach. And um, <clears throat> she's suggesting that this lack of mutual respect between the artist and the audience, if you, if you give these trigger warnings, so I'm interested in your opinion about this, Van, as well. I, I, I sit on I sit on the side of the fence with this that I do for general health and safety warnings in life, to be honest, which is I can understand why they are there because, you know, there'll always be someone that needs it. I am not one of those people, and I, you know, generally associate with people for whom they would not be needed, but... You know, if for the sake of a warning, slap the warning on. If it's gonna, if it's gonna cut down on you know the inevitable whining from somebody, then great. I don't <laughs> particularly think that a lot of the time that they're they're they're, they're well judged. I mean, noticeably there was a there was a warning this past week attached to uh, the streaming release of Poor Things that uh, warned you about the prevalence of smoking in the film. Which, if you've seen Poor Things is the last thing that you're actually <laughs> taking away from that film and complaining about. Yeah, but really if, if it helps Disney sleep at night, then mm. fair play. Isn't it? Yeah, isn't I mean, it, um, can, can I just make that one point? Because because actually, one thing that I've sort of sort of struggled to wrap my head around with this story is that, so far as I'm aware, there have always kind of been trigger warnings on films. There is that there's that black card, isn't there? At the, the cinema. BBFC card, yeah, yeah, that gives you a it gives you a a, a rating, you know, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, whatever, and then it says underneath, you know. Um, Adult themes, uh, sex, violence, you know, etc. These things, I, since since I've been going to cinemas, you know, I'm 33, we've had effectively trigger warnings on films, have we not? We have, but it's theatres as well, though. So they're talking about theatres as well. And, and and they're saying that the, the trigger warnings in theatre should be scrapped. And actually, um, Ray Fiennes, who uh, has made a funny com- comment, I think, here, he's saying that people should be shocked and disturbed yeah. by what they see. Should they be shocked and disturbed? I, I mean, when you think about when you went to the theatre when, when you were a teenager, it, I, I found that, you know, one of my, my very first experiences were shocking and and were disturbing sometimes. I think I went and watched Another Country in one of the London theatres and watching, you know, for the first time people running around naked, for example, so so close, was a bit shocking. Should there be a warning on that? Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, Godzilla Minus One has won visual effects, by the way. That's what I'm talking. Mm. Good film, that, Van? Seen it? Oh, very impressive, very impressive. And we are talking, there's 610 visual effects shots in that movie that they have made for less, on a budget of less than 15 million. I think it's a team of 15 animators as well. And the work that they have turned out for this is top notch. It looks better than a lot of, in fact, every $300 million blockbuster that we've had in the past year or two. You you start this uh, alongside something like Ant-Man Quantumania, which I believe was on the list, God help us. Um, um, and the difference is night and day. I mean, Godzilla Minus One is a stunning-looking film. It's a brilliant movie anyway, regardless of whether or not you like Godzilla. But those visual effects are just absolutely sterling. Um, okay. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have your company tonight, Van. How, how long is your night? How long has this gone for? What time has it finished? Oh, I, I, think, I think I've got at least another two hours, maybe two and a half. Okay. All right. Enjoy. This is your. This is your. Uh, this is your sort of like Super Bowl, though, isn't it, my friend? This is big. It's, it's, it's a Patriots Super Bowl, though. Thanks to Oppenheimer, it's like going into a, into a Patriots game at the Super Bowl. You know how the ending's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Van Conniff, uh, film critic. Thank you, my friend. It's always lovely to have you. We, we only really speak once a year these days, which is we should uh, we should fix that uh, and and have you on more. But for now, Van, thank you. Till the next time, Daryl. Thank you very much, uh, Van Conniff, with us on Times Radio and Adira Tudor as well.